Thank you. Can you hear me there? Yes. Perfect. So can you see my screen or do I have to do... You have to share your screen. Perfect. That's my screen. So um, thank, thank you all for uh, coming along tonight and thank you for inviting me to join your group. Um, unfortunately, I don't think my slide's going to be as nice as Robin's, but it's what I learned back in school, how to do a PowerPoint, so we'll take it from here. But um, yeah, so today I'm speaking about farm scale uh, biogas uh, plant, which we built uh, back in 2016. Um, with the view to doing something different uh, other than agriculture in order to potentially enhance what we do as a business. Um, so I'll click here. So in introduction, I graduated uh, Agricultural College in Aberdeen with a BSc in Agriculture in 2010. I, myself and my one of my good friends worked on a farm in Australia for three months, travelled about saw what was going on in the world in different parts, New Zealand, America, Peru, Argentina, Uruguay, went and looked at a lot of farm operations over there to see if there was different ways, but, you know, climate's our biggest restrictor and, you know, the forefathers, they've not been going wrong in the past. So bringing in techniques from other parts of the world didn't really fit. So I returned home um, to help run the farm and uh, the family business and we were farming predominantly cereals and growing quite a few acres of potatoes um but you know we had to look at different avenues for revenue as i said earlier on so i soon realized that in order to compete in agriculture my father and i had to source external means of income to enhance our business and this is where we came up with the idea of looking into ad plant um, we'd already built a co-share with my father's brother on another farm, a wind turbine, a 500 kilowatt wind turbine. We've got some solar, um, but we looked at ways to integrate what we do um, farming wise and um, with a source of income, you know, uh, that we can get from an AD plant. Now, with all these renewables at the time, the security of a feeding tariff and the RHI for 20 years, for a farmer to be told you were getting consistent money linked to inflation, um, if you could get the product right to feed to the plant, you were going to make the gas which returns you money. So we were very confident that we can do this. So we went down the line of looking at it. So from the first day of research in 14, we were up and running in exactly two years to the week. Um, through planning, through discussions with AD firms. Um, and uh, we went with a company from Austria called Biogest. Um, but after the AD plant was up and running, uh, the tank for us took about six to eight months to homogenize. So the power generated uh, is significantly lower than forecasted, which was a big cash flow problem because uh, the salesman never tells you about the fine print. They always tell you about how great it's going to go from the very start. And uh, that wasn't the case, but we're through that period now. Um, we're up and running. So the initial stage for us was to find the right crop for us to grow to suit our climate. Um, now, there's quite a lot of energy crops. As Robin was saying, with the plant that Aberdeen built, they were after a certain period of time where they an AD plant had to be ran on half waste and half crop or residues. We got in before a deadline where we could be 100% crop. Uh, and there was other certain crops, you know, from grass silage to maize and other high energy crops, sugar beet. But in Scotland, we're limited to what we can grow. So our options are a lot less in the south of England because of the temperatures they get, the growing season. So we decided to grow with rye because it's usually harvested in about July, whereas the maize up in Scotland, you'll be cutting it in end of October, November. So for us, that's potato lifting season. So we got this out of the way. So this is predominantly what a field of rye will look like. Um, in, in certain years, you can get up to six feet tall. This year, it's about six foot two. 
um, big bulky biomass crop. You'll be looking to take off about 50 tonnes a hectare, so 20 tonnes an acre um, for feedstock. Um, and financially, it stacks up quite well against other other cereal crops. So for farmers out and about, it's quite good for them to, to, to be growing it because once it's cut in July, they can get on and they don't have to wait and they don't have to combine it and they don't have to worry about rain. Um, so yeah, so we grow a lot of rye. So as I say, we cut the rye in July and we clamp it into a silage pit. And by doing this, we layer it in as the trailers are bringing the crop in. We layer it in like a wedge with with tractors with what we call buck rakes, which scatter the rye across. And as the tractors are rolling over it all the time, we're squeezing the oxygen out of it because you need to get the oxygen out of it in order to create the right fermentation process. And that way that'll bring down the acidity and it starts to, to, to turn the feedstock into um, suitable for going into the plant. So after about two weeks of the silage being under cover, um, we deliver it to the feeding hopper where it enters the digester. So here is a photo of our feeding hopping system where the silage clamp once it comes from there, that's the feedstock, as you can see on the top of the feeding hopper. Um, so once it's in there, every half an hour, the, the, the AD plant will take a feed. Now we can alter it, the timings of everything, but we've got it down to every half an hour, just a wee drip feed every time. And it's enough, uh, you know, um, to keep it flowing all nice and well. You're not dumping a large dump into it. It's just drip feeding it. So. So what it does here, as you can see from uh, where my mouse is, it, it comes in here and these augers, these four motors along there, they'll auger it up into the top tube and it comes across into the second auger and gets forced down into the, the outer ring of the digester, which is called the primary digester. Um, so once the rise entered, it's, it starts a process where the real magic happens. Uh, biogas is produced by anaerobic digestion with methylogen and anaerobic organisms which digest material inside its closed system or fermentation of biodegradable material. So what I'm about to show you is this video will show you digestate bubbling away at about 44 degrees uh, Celsius and the bubbles are small pockets of gas being released by the bugs. So it's not the longest video in the world so I can show you again if we need to. Um, hopefully it works. Here we go. There's the video of it all bubbling away and that's the gas releasing out of the digestate and, and coming up to the ceiling. Um, so hopefully you all got that. It's not the longest in the world. Um, from here, the gas rises to the roof of the digester where it's a concrete roof on this design that we've got. It, it finds its way into the pipe work coming out of the top of the digester and ha heads towards what you call a gas bag holder. Now the gas bag acts as a large overflow so our engine can get a constant demand of fuel. Like I, some, like I say, the similar idea of a fuel tank, kind of not really want to think about it like that, but it is, it's delivering a constant feed of fuel to the, the engine without the engine having to hunt for it all the time if you get fluctuations of gas. Um, so the gas rises along to the top of the tank, which the, all the gravel sitting on top, and it comes up these two pipe systems here. Now these pipes join and head down the side of the digester and up into this big concrete tower, which is where the gas bag is, uh, it's hung from the middle of the digester where it can open and uh, expand and close as the gas levels are rising up and down, but the engine can keep a constant, constant speed. Obviously if the gas bag isn't keeping up with the engine, the, 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 the fuel load that we're demanding at the engine, the engine will come back down to a particular level of kilowatts, say 250 kilowatts rather than 500 kilowatts until the gas level builds back up again and away it goes. So from here, the engine draws the gas up a pipeline, which is buried about 10 feet in the ground. Now, the reason we do this is to allow the gas to condense and it, the, the gas line is on an upslope towards the engine. So as the gas condenses, because it's still obviously at 44 degrees, well, it'll be less than that, but the water it condenses, the water runs back down the pipeline into a condensation trap, which we have with a submersible pump, which gets rid of it out of the system. 
because water in the engine doesn't do us any favors, you know, um, it won't do any engine any favors. But so the gas we're producing, we're roughly trying to produce about 255 meter cubes of gas per hour to run a 500 kilowatt hour electrical production. The gas comp com comprises of, it can vary from 50 to 53% methane, about 0.2 of oxygen and about 150 parts per million uh, hydrogen sulfate. But with the feedstock we're using, the sulfur in it is generally a lot less than, you know, your food feeds to uh, food waste plants where they they will suffer with a lot of hydrogen sulfur um, but they have a different way of handling it than we do um, so here's a video clip of the engine running so this is the fuel line coming in here this is the engine this is the ignition system firing the, the gas and this is the cooling system that comes off the back of the engine cold going in, hot water coming out is the red. And that's, uh, that engine is a 500 kilowatt man engine with a 500 kilowatt Stamford generator on the end, producing the electricity that we then directly uh, supply to the grid. Um, all right. um, so yeah, once the power is away down our grid, that's an off-site, um, a way to go into kettles and iPhones and you name it. But so once the digester is given off all the gas, it's then transferred to our final storage tank where we require it for applying to your crops. Um, digester is an excellent source of uh, MP and K, calcium, boron, manganese, magnesium, copper, just all the trace elements along with adding for fantastic organic matter to the soil and you know another way of reducing our carbon footprint without buying in bagged fertilizers we're starting to use a lot of the the digestive ourselves for growing crops um this is the final storage tank where the the the, the slurry will be delivered to digestive sorry will be delivered to once it's finished with and this is our slurry tanker here which uh, we use to spread the crop uh, on top of the uh, spread the digestate on top of the crop the only downside to it is is the volume um that we need to use um because it's quite weak but there is new technology coming out all the time um evaporation systems um but unfortunately they come with quite a hefty price tag to, uh, because digestate is made up with predominantly 70 percent water so if we can extract that and turn it into a a, more, a lot more concentrate product I believe it would have a lot greater value in the marketplace for replacing artificial fertilizers. Um, and here you see this wee tower. Um, it's very, very small compared to Robin's photo of their uh, gas flare. But uh, this is our gas flare. So this is an emergency system that if the engine goes down at any point, what will happen is once the gas bag hits a certain level of percentage on the computer screen, it will trigger the flare into fire and the flare will burn out the gas in the gas bag holder and bring it down to a certain level, stop flaring, and once it builds back up, it'll flare off again. So it's not a very nice sight when you see that thing going because you know it's not going down the engine and uh, it's costing you money rather than earning you money. But on the outro of my presentation, you know, what is the future for biogas? Um, ever since we built the plant, I very much didn't think we would be exporting electricity by the time the feeding tariff cycle of 20 years was over. I, I'm always one to be thinking, you know, where are we going next? You know, the possibility of hydrocarbon fuels from electricity for transport is massive. I mean, unfortunately, there's, for some reason, there's a massive push towards battery technology and vehicles, which I do not think is the way forward because the system in place at the moment for the grid network can't handle everybody going to batteries. So a hydrocarbon fuel is, you know, we can make it in a certain designated area and deliver it to fueling stations and it can go into cars and uh, make synthetic fuels. So I really think that is the way forward. Powering battery stations, um, mobile uh, static battery stations. 
We can continue with exporting power to the grid, but once the feeding tariff and the HI runs out, AD is not feasible to continue. Wind farms are because the maintenance costs and the input costs are minimal compared to the return, but AD with the feedstock cost, they're so, so high. All these plants, if that was the only option, they'll just have to shut down. But with everybody that's involved with the industry, I don't think that's going to happen. So I think hydrocarbon fuels is a massive, massive future, uh, along with hydrogen production. Um, we looked at doing very similar to what Aberdeen have done with Dundee City Council going down the route of hydrogen uh, production. Um, but unfortunately, because things couldn't be organised quick enough, we'd never managed to get as far as having the discussion um, with Dundee City Council, but we did with the Scottish Government. But um, yes, that didn't go go overly well. So yeah, that's that's kind of what we do. Um, yeah, thank you for taking the time to listen to me waffle on about biodigesters. And in the Q and A session, please feel free to ask me any questions. And uh, yeah, many thanks for having me on. Hopefully, it was uh, informative.